I'm going to preface all of this like, like what I was telling a few people earlier. Normally, all of these sessions I've been doing for the last nine years have been about something I know something about. I don't know anything. Well, I know a few things about Mary, but I didn't know. I, I decided to do something that was actually going to make me work. And boy, this one made me work. I'm going to tell you right now. And, um, and I'm so glad I did this uh, really deep dive because it's given me an even greater appreciation of our amazing Catholic heritage. We often forget what treasures we have in our church. Uh, and, you know, I appreciate what other churches have. I appreciate the strengths and the gifts that they bring to the larger experience of being a follower and disciple of Christ. But when I go deeper into something like this, it drives home, for me at least, the fact that we have the, and it's always been said, the fullness of the truth. And I think that's a very well put phrase. We have the fullness of, the, of that truth. So let's begin uh, with a word of prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. O oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for our time together this evening as we learn something about Mary, as we go deeper into this great story of her amazing love that she was singled out among all women to be the vessel by which you were made present among us. Bless us, Lord, in our time together, that as we grow in our understanding of Mary and her role, that we too may imitate her, especially in her wisdom to say yes. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I, wanted, I don't normally begin in this fashion because I am not a person given to poetry. Okay, In high school... We, I don't know if, if you're like me and of a, what we call a certain age. In high school, we had to memorize a poem. Anybody remember that in high school? I chose Langston Hughes, okay, which raised one or two eyebrows, I think, in my amazingly white community. Uh, and I chose one called Drum. And I don't know why it was. Maybe I like the meter of it. And maybe I like the fact that it, it had something to say about our time, even though he had written it quite a number of decades earlier. But I remember it even today. Bear in mind that death is a drum beating forever till the last worms come. To answer its call till the last stars fall. Until the last atom is no atom at all. Until time is lost and there is no air, and space itself is nothing, nowhere. Death is a drum, a signal drum, calling all life to come, come, come. Wasn't that cheerful? <laughs> Can you imagine? Naturally, that's going to appeal to a 15-year-old who is very angry about the Vietnam War because I had just registered for the selective service and I think it was like two months later they ended the draft you know it was like whoa missed that one but the poem I chose for this evening is by William Butler Yeats and it's entitled Mother of God and I'm going to share this with you as we begin because I think he uh, he reaches into the mystery of the whole phenomenon of Mary in an extraordinary way the threefold terror of love, a fallen flare, through the hollow of an ear, wings beating about the room, the terror of all terrors that I bore, the heavens in my womb. Had I not found content among the shows every common woman knows, chimney corner, garden walk, or rocky cistern where we tread the clothes and gather all the talk, what is this flesh I purchased with my pains? This fallen star my milk sustains? This love that makes my heart's blood stop or strikes a sudden chill into my bones and bids my hair stand up? Isn't that amazing? And this is certainly not the saccharine verse like the worst of our Marian hymns. 
And it's nothing like the mawkish sentimentality of such 19th century songs like Bring Flowers of the Fairest or On This Day, O Beautiful Mother. I think rather the poet has captured the raw reality of a human being having been singled out to participate in the only cosmic encounter between God and humanity designed to reorder humanity and the history of the world. From the earliest days of the church, Mary has held a place of honor. The nature of that place of honor has shifted over time, even to a degree that theologians struggled to understand. She's been exalted by some almost to the point of deification, and as a result, has been negated by some as a knee-jerk reaction, along with others, to some of the excesses of Marian devotion, especially in the Middle Ages. Some have championed the cause of elevating her status to that of a co-redemptrix with Christ. This caused a lot of concern among many, largely because of the very nature of what the Redeemer was. The Redeemer was the one who paid the ultimate price. Protestant Christianity has seen the Catholic Church's exaltation of Mary as a major stumbling block to Christian unity. The Western Church and the Orthodox Churches of the East both honor and hold Mary in the highest regard, but there are differences of the observation of that honor. For example, the Latin Church in the West, that's, that's us, has her sharing with Elijah and Jesus the privilege of being assumed directly to God, while the church in the East prefers a more ambiguous approach, saying that she has fallen asleep in the Lord and calling it the dormition of Mary rather than the assumption. And then from the obscurity of her origins in Nazareth and having been singled out by an angel, Mary began an ascent that bridged time such that she would be honored with the words that were spoken by the Hebrews to Judith. Thou art the glory of Jerusalem, the joy of Israel, and the honor of our people. Does anybody know where this is? This is the main entrance to the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception in Washington, D.C., In speaking about the doctrines and dogmas that surround the Blessed Virgin Mary, we're going to be looking at those in depth as we go along. But I just wanted to point out the first one is one of the most interesting ones in the fact that there has been no real agreement even from the beginning about what happened to the Blessed Virgin Mary upon her death. Or did she even die? Okay. And so there has been this sort of a ambiguous understanding of falling asleep in Christ, the dormition, or the assumption, which in and of itself was only defined as a doctrine almost less than about 70 years ago in the church. But largely, again, due to our understanding of Mary, we have a sharing of understanding with the Orthodox Church that transcends what I want to call the niceties of doctrinal uh, details, okay? So in our study, we'll start with what we know from the Bible and then look at what the earliest writers had to say about her and her veneration in both the apostolic and the sub-apostolic eras. Now, what do I mean by that? When I say the apostolic era, I'm talking about the time when the apostles were living. 
Okay? The sub-apostolic era is really after the, last, the death of the last living apostle and that period of time when the church, the early church, was really generating itself. You might want to call it the second generation of, of the church, okay, before the times of the creeds. Then we're going to investigate the origins of Marian dogmas as they come to us through the writings of the church fathers. Now, be aware, however, that because of the spurious nature of some of the writings of the early church fathers, some of what has been used in the past in terms of Marian uh, apologistics is perhaps a little unreliable. But we'll see what the fathers have to say and how some of the really important dogmas emerged about the same time as the creeds of the church. Okay. Especially as uh, they pertain to the most critical aspects of who Mary was in terms of her maternity, her virginity, her perpetual virginity, and so on and so forth. And then from there we're going to go to the Middle Ages through the 18th century, looking at some of the cults of the Virgin as they developed. Um, we'll see some interesting ones, especially the cult of the Black Madonna. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the various Black Madonnas. We're not going to go into that tonight. We will go into it in more depth later. But one of the most famous is from Poland, and that's Our Lady of Częstochowa. A very popular devotion that the Poles brought to the United States with them. And that's a Black Madonna. Um, the other one, probably less familiar, the one you see there on the right, is actually the uh, uh, Our Lady of the Hermitage, or the Black Madonna of Switzerland. Or she's really referred to as Our Lady of Einsiedeln, because her image has been uh, for the last, about the last 1,000 years in the monastery of Maria Einsiedeln in Switzerland. And then we're going to go on to the New World and see how uh, Marian, appar Marian apparitions and such happen. But at the heart of our examination, we're really going to concentrate on the apparitions. And specifically those that have gained full approbation by the church. And then on through it, we'll see how Mary has inspired art and music. So... Um, I think this is going to be an interesting time, and I hope, I hope it's interesting for you. And of course, I will give us time for some interaction and questions uh, about what we're doing. For 2,000 years, Mary has been the most frequent name given to girls at baptism, highlighting the fact that it is the female name that is pronounced most often in the Western world. Mary is portrayed in art and music more than any other woman in history. The Virgin Mary has been an inspiration to more people than any woman's ever lived. She remains so in the 20th century despite it being regarded as secularistic in contrast with these previous ages of faith. But secularistic or not, the past 150 years has, for example, witnessed a continuation and probably an acceleration of the phenomenon of apparitions of Mary for which the 19th century has become almost what we would call a golden age. But Mary has seen largely as being someone in our faith who absolutely crosses all cultures. A famous uh, Marian scholar's name was uh, Rene Laurentin. He estimated some years ago that there had been well over 200 apparitions of Mary since the 1930s. And they continue unabated. In uh, Bosnia Herzegovina, which in 1914 was the fuse that acknowledged the First World War. And which throughout the century following has continued to be a venue for religious and ethnic violence. The Blessed Virgin Mary appeared in 1981 in Medjugorje, a small Croatian village 
of about 250 households. Since then, more than 40 million pilgrims have visited there. Have any of y'all been to Medjugorje? So you'll know what that phenomenon is. Okay. Despite the landmines, it has been given credit for the religious reawakening of the Croatian nation. Less well known is the fact that this phenomenon is not confined to Catholic countries. For instance, in Orthodox Greece, for example, apparitions of the Virgin uh, in the 20th century have become a major force. The ecumenical movement, which garnered a great deal of energy and enthusiasm in the first half of the 20th century, has also been a catalyst for the re-examination of Mary, especially with those Protestant traditions who reacted so negatively to the emphasis on Marian devotions in the 16th century. For these traditions who cannot ignore what the Bible says in reference to Mary, and particularly in the second chapter of Luke, wherein she proclaims that all generations henceforth shall call me blessed. It is a matter of significance, given the Protestant allegiance and sole reliance on the Bible, that for them to question this has become unavoidable. And eventually it's come to be seen in significant ways as epitomizing many, gener many of the general, general, I can't talk, generalizations that divide the churches. So what then is the legitimate role of the post-biblical tradition in Christian teaching? What is the role of the saints and above all of this saint in Christian worship and devotion. And then most importantly in this conversation, who has the authority to decide in matters of Christian teaching? This meant that 20th century exploration, explorations in this regard have made the history of Mary a big issue and its implications for Catholic, Orthodox, and even within Protestant and Jewish and Muslim communities. Um, Mariology, associated Mariology, has often been a charge used against the Catholic Church with the term Mariolatry. In terms of uh, saying we have elevated Mary from being who the, the humble maid that she claimed to be to being a deity, okay, which of course is false. So for the rest of our time uh, together, starting with the Bible, I'm going to try to show historically what Mary has and continues to mean to us. So let's begin with what we know from the Bible. Novum in vetere latet, vete in novo petet. The New Testament is hidden in the old. And the old becomes visible in the new. Okay. The reader of the Gospels is at first surprised to find so little about Mary. And this shouldn't surprise us as the earliest readers of the four Gospels was not reading only the Gospels, or not even just New Testament writings, but they were also deeply, deeply embedded in the Old Testament. Remember this, it's often easy to forget. When the Bible talks about Scripture, they're not talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the letters of Paul, and all of that. They're talking about the Old Testament. That's the Bible of Jesus. Now, Christianity didn't even call it the Old Testament until well into the 5th century. Why? Nothing's old until you have something new. Okay? It's not your old car until you've bought a new car, right? Alright, it was simply 
the Bible. That's often hard for us to remember to, to put that into context, particularly when it comes to the most formative period of time in the history of Christianity, and that's those first five centuries, when we're deciding what it is that we believe. You know, and finally, we actually came up with documents that began with the words, I believe, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So before there were four Gospels, much less the New Testament, there was Scriptures. And because of the centrality of allegory and typology, and we'll get to that word in a minute, and because of the concept of prophecy and fulfillment, we have to call a Christian and not just a Hebrew scripture, okay? So when we look at the Old Testament, we cannot say it is not a Christian scripture. I argue with a famous um, stand-up comedian. His name is uh, Black, Lewis Black. Got a foul mouth on him, I mean. But he goes on a tirade about the Old Testament. And, he, and he, he's a Jew, and so he says, it's our book. It's not your book. And I'm going, excuse me. Wait just a moment. It is our book. It is very much our book. So, for our purposes, the biblical evidence is important. And it's interesting because of its anticipation of the subsequent traditions surrounding Mary. Or, or I should probably more accurately say that the biblical evidence of Mary is interesting in the light of how the subsequent tradition has used it. And this is found in this phrase from the Christian gospel of the house and lineage of David. We all know that, right? When do we hear that? At Christmas. Of the house and and lineage of David. As it stood in the gospel, this referred to Joseph, right? Not to Mary. Her lineage was not traced in the genealogies provided by Matthew and Luke, but it was also those same two gospels that made a point of the virginal conception of Jesus and therefore of the conclusion that Joseph was only supposed by some, but clearly not the evangelist, to have been the father of Jesus. If son of David was in the language of the Gospels a way of affirming the continuity of Jesus with Israel and a continuity of his kingship in a line that stretched all the way back to King David, then his descent from David has to be through only a human parent, one human parent, Mary, who must then be also able to claim to be of the house and lineage of David. Now that reasoning has provided the justification for the practice of going far beyond the New Testament by searching through the Old Testament scriptures and prophecies for parallels that could enrich and amplify the minimal data that we find in the New Testament. Now we're going to talk about, see all this shortly. But these sources are going to enrich and more importantly amplify what little is found in the New Testament. And it starts with, of all people, Miriam, the sister of Moses. Because of her name, but also to Eve and all the female personifications. The whole process of appropriating this material for the purpose of Marian devotion and doctrine, which can be described as a methodology of amplification, was on the one hand part of a much larger process of allegorical and figurative interpretation of the Bible. But it was on the other hand, and almost against the intention of those who practiced it, a powerful affirmation that because Mary was, according to the reasoning summarized earlier of the house and lineage of David, that she represented the unbreakable link between Jewish and Christian history, between the very first covenant 
within which she was born, okay, and the second covenant to which she gave birth. And that's vitally important, okay, that these two covenants are found in a person. Does that make sense? So that even the most virulent of Christian anti-Semites could not deny that she, the most blessed of all women, was a Jew. I, 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 I often, to my everlasting embarrassment, and for which I will pay for considerably in the afterlife, when I was upset with my mother, would remind her that Mary never prayed the rosary. <laughs> Nor did she ever go to Mass. And you could just see her blood pressure just... Shoo. In my opinion, one of the most impressive results of the Mariological interpretation of the Old Testament was the application of the linguistic imagery of the Song of Songs to Mary. Nigra sum sed formosa. I am black but beautiful. These were almost the first words of the bride in the song. And herein we find the origins of the black Madonna. From those words came the biblical justification for so many of the images that shunned the notion that she was a white European. Okay. And we'll look at those later on. But let's move on to a very more specific look at Mary in the larger context of Scripture, beginning with an understanding of biblical typology. And before you leave today, for those for whom all this is, I'm going to make probably enormously obtuse, is some, uh, some examples of biblical typology, okay, that you can you're, please, please take home with you today. Typology in the New Testament. Now, for us to understand Mary from a biblical perspective, we have to have some grasp of biblical typology. So, what is that? Now, the last thing I want to do is bore people. So, if all hands go up and say, Father, we know what biblical typology is, I'll be glad to move on. <laughs> well, all right then. <laughs> In short, it's a Christian form of interpre biblical interpretation that proceeds on the assumption that God placed anticipation of Christ in the laws, events, and the people of the entire Old Testament. All right? Types are like pictures that come alive in a new and exciting way when seen through the eyes of Christ's revelation. St. Augustine said that the Old Testament is the new concealed but the New Testament is the old revealed, like I mentioned earlier. In the, in the fifth chapter of Romans, Paul says that Adam was a type of the one who was to come. In other words, Christ. Adam is a type of Christ, if you will. Early Christians understood that the Old Testament was full of types or pictures that were fulfilled in the New Testament. For example... Um, Noah's Ark is a type of Christian baptism. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 22. We see that clearly. St. Paul explains that circumcision foreshadowed Christian baptism. Colossians chapter 2. Jesus uses a bronze serpent as a type of his crucifixion in John chapter 3. And we see it prefigured in the book of Numbers, chapter 21. You remember the whole story, right? You know, the people who have been bitten by snakes. They were called seraph serpents, fiery snakes. And so they're begging to be delivered. I'm going to make the story very short. But um, the uh, cure, if you will is to make a bronze serpent 
mount it on a staff, and have the people look at it, and those who look at it will be cured. Now that bronze serpent has been interpreted many years, and even doubled, and now it's called an Ascalapus, which is the symbol of medicine. Okay, that's, that's the symbol of healing. And so following that thing that is lifted up, so it becomes a typology of a processional cross. When you see the processional cross, and you know who does it better than we do? Episcopalians. They do a lot of things better than we do because they have more money. But that's beside, <laughs> that's quite beside the point. But if you've ever been to an Episcopalian mass and the crucifer walks down the aisle, everybody in the church bows their head to the crucifix as it goes by. What do we do? We're slapping the children. But, you know, there's lots of ways in which we can do it. But you see the connectivity. You see, that's typology right there. The Passover lamb prefigures the sacrifice of Christ, 1 Corinthians. Paul says that Abraham considered that God was able to raise men even from the dead. Hence, prefiguratively speaking, he did receive him back, which we find in Hebrews chapter 11. The catechism states, Mary, in whom the Lord himself has just made his dwelling, is the daughter of Zion in person. The Ark of the Covenant, the place where the glory of the Lord dwells. She is the dwelling of God with men. And that's in the, in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. We could spend a lot of time on a deep... Oh, there it is. That's the, uh, the story for Numbers 21. You see the serpent on the, on the staff. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. So that whoever believes in him would have eternal life. There's, that's a classic piece of typology. Um, and then, of course, you've got the Lamb of God. And you've got these wonderful things. We could, again, we could spend a great deal of time. But let's look at it diagrammatically. Let me go back to... Um, yeah, no, I'll stay here. Irenaeus of Lyon would spend a lot of time on a deeper understanding of typology. But let's start with Mary as being the antitype of Eve. So I'm introducing a new word, an antitype. Irenaeus of Lyon wrote in the year 180, thus the knot of Eve's disobedience was loosed by the obedience of Mary. What the virgin Eve had bound in unbelief, the virgin Mary loosed through faith. Thirty years later, Justin Martyr wrote, For Eve, who was a virgin and undefiled, having conceived the word of the serpent, brought forth disobedience and death. But the virgin Mary received faith and joy when the archangel announced the good tidings to her that the Spirit of the Lord would come upon her and the power of the Most High would overshadow her. Let's, let's see if we can look at this diagrammatically. Eve is the virgin and undefiled from the beginning. That was God's plan. But receive the word of the angel Satan. We often forget that who was Satan? A fallen angel. She responded with distrust of God. What did God say? You can have all of this. Don't touch that. What did the snake say? Oh, please. What does God know? You know, I'm an angel. I, I, I know all that. You know, he's just blowing. And here's the tree. Try this. You'll like it. It'll give you knowledge. You'll know more than anyone else. How can you resist? And she couldn't. She took it. What did God say? You can have all this, all of this, but not that. She responded with distrust of God. She responded with disobedience. And that resulted in death. Death came into the world. The antitype, again, virgin, undefiled, received the word of an angel, but this time responded 
in, with faith in God. Responded with obedience. With action that would then result in life for all. As you read in Genesis, what happens? You're going you're to live by dirt for the rest of your life. You're going to toil and it's not going to be good for you. And it's going to be miserable. And then you know her children didn't behave. And it, it was just misery from then on out. Disobedience, obedience. So y'all are catching what type anti-type is, all right? These two women are hinges on salvation around which so much turns. Eve's distrust of God led her to reach out and grab the fruit of the tree. But Mary's faith resulted in the fruit of her womb being nailed to a tree for the salvation of the world. And when it's viewed this way, we understand more clearly Mary's role in salvation history. Then there's a typology that goes even beyond analogous individuals. Remember, a biblical type can also be a thing or an action which has its own identity, but at the same time can prefigure a person, a thing, or an action. Uh, for example, Mary, as we talked earlier, was often seen as the Ark of Noah, built by divine command, who escaped the effects of sin. Genesis 6. Why did Noah build the ark? To escape. To escape from the, the sin, the depredation. It was going to be what ushered in the new world. That's what the ark, Noah's ark was. By the way, if you want to see it, there's one in Kentucky. For sixty dollars, you can you can go in and and, and see it. I not I can't recommend it because I've not been there yet. <coughs> then you've got Jacob's ladder. This is a ladder that reached from earth to heaven and witnessed the ascent and descent of angels. It was seen as a type of the future intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary. How many of you have ever been to Bath? England. You've been to Bath. Bath, I think they say. There's an abbey in Bath. Beautiful abbey church. Not far from the building where the Roman baths are. And if you go around to the front of the abbey church, carved in stone is Jacob's ladder. And you see the angels going up and the angels coming down. It's absolutely marvelous, you know. We don't do those sorts of interesting things anymore. <laughs> Then the fathers also saw the burning bush of Moses as a type of Mary because it held the presence of God within itself but did not experience material corruption. You find this in the third chapter of Exodus. In the Song of Songs or Canticle of Canticles or whatever your particular translation calls it, Mary is depicted as the impenetrable tower of David and as the enclosed and inviolable garden. You'll find that in Song of Songs chapter 4, which reflects both her purity and her perpetual virginity. The temple of God in 1 Kings 8 is represented in, as, as a sanctified house of God, which foreshadowed Mary as the future tabernacle of Jesus. And then, of course, we have references to created wisdom in the feminine gender from the book of wisdom. And we also see this in foreshadowing Mary, who claims as one of her titles, the seat of wisdom.